أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Altaf, you're close to my heart too, bro, but that's as far as it's going to get. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's the first time for me in Perth. And I see young faces which look just like the faces in Melbourne. I, as he said, I'm a teacher and I teach young, well, high school students. I've lectured at university a few times. So we've learnt a lot about youth. I was born here myself in Australia, raised in Australia, among the Australian society and the Western ideals and all of that. I also lived overseas, so got to see the overseas world as well and their traditions. You can say I'm a cross between the, old tra the traditions of our parents or grandparents, I'm sure you can relate to that, and the traditions of the current generation. I'm also a marriage celebrant. A marriage celebrant who does marriage, who ruins people's lives. I don't ruin, I mean, I... <laughs> I was, I was, that was a joke. I marry people off, but I don't do divorces. We try to counsel people in their relationships. The reason I said that is because I want to give you an idea of the background that I have about relationships and the youth growing up in this society, the clash they have between the two cultures, if they come from a, spe a specific country, the traditions that they hold, the customs, and the customs of the West that they were brought up in, also the clash between their religious ideals and upholding other things uh, that they're faced with, challenges of the youth. So we've gone through all of that. I have a Facebook page, if you look at it, I have so many advices there as well about that. There's also a few um, series, lectures and talks. There's one called um, Youth Issues. I'd like you to listen to that, it's recent, and it addresses a lot of the stuff that youth are going through. My brothers and sisters, I'm not here to judge. I've got to judge myself before I judge you. But you've invited me here and you've come to listen to me. So what I'm going to do, inshallah, I'm going to present to you an objective approach. Now the brother said that a lot of you here are academic, you're quite knowledgeable, alhamdulillah. A lot of you are still in high school, some of you are at uni. So you'll know what the word objective means. Just looking at things without judging. And just sharing with you what I've found in this society and giving some advice, some of the problems that we're facing, some of the solutions we can look at. My brothers and sisters, the topic that's been given to me is a sensitive one. It's not an easy topic to talk about. It was easier maybe 20 years ago. I used to give this topic 20 years ago and it was easy to talk to youth and say, this is haram and that's haram. And they say, bro, I want to get really religious. I want to get back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it used to work a lot. But now there's a lot of this, this people have advanced more and they're addressing more complex issues. And we're faced with social media. Social media has caused people to think very differently now. There's a lot of self-centeredness as well. And people are thinking about what makes them happy. But they don't understand what happiness means. And so people are leaving, for example, marriages just because they fe don't feel happy. Sheikh Muhammad Hablus, good friend of mine, walks in, takes over the scene. Haram is embarrassed. No, don't worry. I'm not as thundery as Sheikh Muhammad Hablus, but inshallah, I'll do my best. Brothers and sisters in Islam, so let's begin with the topic that's been given to me. It's part of the seven who will be shaded under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said they will be shaded. And shaded is a metaphor. It doesn't literally mean that you're going to have a tree that you sit under on the day of judgment or a cloud that's going to be above you. Maybe, maybe that's how it's going to look. Allahu alam. What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to special, make you a special person on the day of judgment. He will choose you from among all the trillions of people from the time of Ad until the end of time. And he will put you under his special protection in such a way that you will not feel the heat of the sun that will be only a mile away from your head. While others are sweating up to their ankles, others will be sweating up to their knees. Some people will be sweating up to their shoulders. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, listen to this, he said, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يُلْجِمُهُ الْعَرَقِ And some of them, their sweat will make them unable to speak. Will make them unable to speak. 
So can you imagine how a sweat will be on you if you can't speak? It only means one thing, that the sweat literally will rise like you're sitting inside of a big uh, bucket of water and the water and the sweat has reached your mouth and you're on your tiptoes. If you open your mouth, the sweat will go into your mouth. So it says, يُلْجِمُهُ Unable to speak, can't open their mouth. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, what is this from? He said, everyone according to the sins which they accumulated consciously when they were in the former life. You know what consciously is? You deliberately did it. You knew that it was wrong. You knew the consequence, but you went ahead with it anyway. Some of these sins are forgiven. Allah is the forgiver, the most merciful. So for a person to receive those sweat of their sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that they deserve it. And can you imagine a sweat being heated under the heat of the sun, boiling under the sun. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that. And other people will be under the types of terrible misery. Then Allah chooses special people to protect them from all of this. Who are they? Seven types. Two types that I'm going to talk about today are, number one, and the Prophet ﷺ said in Arabic, this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. There's no doubt about its authenticity. He said, وَرَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُمْ رَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصِبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ And a man whom a woman, I'll translate it first, whom a woman with prestige or power and beauty calls him seduces him and he says I fear Allah that's the first one and the second one I'm going to talk about وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَهُ and a man who in the middle of the night when no one was around he was alone he remembers Allah and from that remembrance his eyes become teary First question, sisters are asking, I can hear you, you're saying, why is it a man? Number one, it's got to do with Arabic language. When the Prophet ﷺ was addressing the people, most often he would address the men in front of him, isn't that correct? So he would say, وَرَجُلْ But automatically, without a doubt, all the scholars of past and present understand and agree that when the Prophet ﷺ says, and a man, it automatically means and a woman. But it's just the circumstance Prophet was in, who he was talking to. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Al Muslimuna wal Muslimat, In al Muslimina wal Muslimati, Wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minati, Wal Qanitina wal Qanitati, Wal Sabirina wal Sabirati, Wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat. Allah says, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the, be the men who donate and the women who donate, the men who are patient and women who are patient, and so on. And the men who are, have God-fearance and the women who have God-fearance, Allah says, right in the end, keeps counting men and women until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they will all have an enormous reward with Allah and a paradise in which they will never get out of and they will have in, they will have enjoyment and happiness forever. Brothers and sisters, so therefore, if the Prophet ﷺ said, and a man, it means also a woman. Same and equally. So let's reverse the hadith now, the first one. And a woman whom a man with power, prestige, and beauty seduces her or calls her to something haram, and she says, I fear Allah. One brother says to me, young man, one of my students, uh, year nine, you know how they are. They talk and ask questions without thinking. He says, bro, I said, I'm your teacher, say Mr. Bilal. He says, Mr. Bilal. He said, am I going to, I'm going to have the shade of Allah. I said, why? How do you know? He goes, a girl said to me yesterday, hey, let's go out together. And I said, I fear Allah. <laughs> he typed it. I fear Allah. That's it. I'm under the shade. No, no, no. It has to be in a situation like what Yusuf alayhi salam was. You all know the story of Yusuf? And he was seduced with the door locked, with no one around. And there was a woman of power and beauty, Imra'atul Aziz, the treasurer's wife. And she said to him, Hey Talak, 
It's so seductive the way she did it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed that verse in several different styles that you can recite it in. Haytalak, hitalak, hitalak, haytulak, different ways, which shows us that she tried every other, every boundary, every way. And Yusuf salam is a slave. Nobody cares if he sleeps with her. Even if he does, she's the one that's going to receive the shame. She's meant to be of high status in society. And Yusuf salam is extremely drop-dead gorgeous. There is no one more beautiful than him except for Adam salam. Did you believe that? Adam salam is more, more beautiful than Yusuf salam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him himself originally and then we were reproduced. So Yusuf salam, on top of that, and she locks the door, she can protect him, and she says to him, Hey Talak. And what does he say? He said, I seek protection from Allah. I seek protection from Allah. Now, what is this? Is she like going to burn him? Is he going to get tortured? He says, I protect me, oh Allah. From what? You tell that to a common man today, they'll say, What do you mean protect? You know, this is, the, this is paradise for us. This is what we've always wanted. This is our dream come true. I'll, I'm, I'll pick on the men because I don't want to pick on the sisters. So this Yusuf salam was in that situation. And we know the rest of the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him in high esteem in the Quran. And in the end, he actually chose the dungeon than being with that woman. Not only that, even other women came along just to show you the intensity of it. And when they heard about the Aziz's wife, the treasurer's wife, they started ridiculing her. So she called them in and she gave them some food in front of them to cut up. And then she told Yusuf to come out. When they saw him, they said, Allahu Akbar, because they believed in Allah. He is not a human being. He is a malak. He's an angel. And they didn't realize that as they were cutting the food that they had in their hands, they were cutting their own hands from how they were mesmerized and hypnotized by his looks. Allah says, Qatta'na. So they cut it over and over again and didn't even realize. And they started telling him, Yusuf, just do what she wants, man. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're gorgeous. We don't want you to end up in prison. Just do it. Just do it. They want to protect him, right? And he went back asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and crying in the night, which is ironic. It's, it's really good that the brothers chose the next part of the seven who will be shaded under Allah, the man who remembers Allah in the night and cries. That's exactly what Yusuf salam did following that incident. He went in the night, nights after night, praying to Allah, crying to Allah, making sajda and say, Qala Rabbi sijnu ahabbu ilay. Because they said, if, you don't do what, if he doesn't do what, I, what I'm telling him to do, he's going to be imprisoned and humiliated. And he made an intimate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rabbi, please. Please put me in prison. It's more beloved. Listen to the words. My heart loves the prison when you compare it to what they're calling me to do, to zina. Zina means adultery, fornication, sleeping around. The actual act of intercourse. And Yusuf is saying, I love the prison more than that. Why? Because the prison is going to be his pathway to Jannah. Her pathway is going to be to hellfire. Which one's the worst prison? The prison of this world or the prison of hellfire? That's how a mu'min thinks. The rest of the world thinks the opposite. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, there will come a time in the future where the young Muslims, especially the young people, al-qabidu ala dinihi kal-qabidu ala al-jamr. He acknowledges that there will come a time where it will be so difficult for people to stick to their religion strongly. That a person who is trying their best to stick to the religion, the person you call religious, the person you look at and you say, wow, he or she is religious. If you look at their life, they're struggling big time, man. They're struggling. It's really hard. It's not easy. And it's like a person holding on to a coal of fire. You know, how long can you hold on to a bead, a, a, heat, a heat bead? Right? But they're trying. They're struggling. Why? Because their love for what is in store for them in the hereafter. They want Allah to be pleased with them. There's nothing more beautiful and makes you more happy than two connections. The connection to Allah and the connection to, guess what? 
your family, the connection to your parents, the connection to your siblings, the connection to your cousins, and the connection to your wife and husband. Family. That makes you happy. Connection. I'm not talking about lust. I'm not talking about desires. I'm not talking about attraction. I'm talking about attachment. And that is the happiness that people are striving for, an attachment. An attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and an attachment with your family. My brothers and sisters in Islam, a religious person is going to struggle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. So do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be merciful and forgiving? Do you think he's, just, he's going to expect everybody to be perfect? No. Young people, you are not expected to be perfect. You're not expected to live a life without sin. Every one of us sins. Put your hands up if you have never sinned. It's a stupid question. Put your hand up if you haven't sinned today. We've all sinned. Man, I was telling the brother, the other, I, was, I was driving, Brother Abdullah, we're having a little discussion. I'm coming out of my driveway, I'm driving, and it's a two-way road. And there was a bus stop. I'm not asking for it. There's a bus stop. The bus comes out, I go, Ya Rab, I can overtake the bus. Ya Rab, I can overtake the bus. You know why? Because about a few meters back, I could see there's a billboard behind it of a woman in lingerie. Now, if the bus goes in front of me, what am I going to do? Where am I going to look, man? Tell me, you tell me, where am I going to look? At the sky? <laughs> so I drove and I'm behind the bus. I have to look at the bus. The billboard is huge. Otherwise, I'll have an accident. My point is, there is haram everywhere. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to judge you for every little haram that you do. Even a man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, I feel bad, I feel bad, man, I feel bad. He says, what did you do? He goes, I, I, you know, I kissed and hugged and I, I went and I saw this girl. And he says, look, do you pray? Do you fast? Do you do your sadaqah? He goes, yes, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He goes, go. They will wipe it all away for you. I don't want the young people to misunderstand that hadith. <laughs> Listen, a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not giving him an excuse. He's not giving him an open door for it. He realized he's ashamed. The guy's ashamed. The guy's about to slap himself out. He wants to repent. That's it. There's no, long, there's no need for the Prophet to sit there drilling him and telling him off. What's that going to benefit? Seriously. The guy's admitting, Ya Rasul, I want it off. He said, do you pray? He goes, he goes, the prayers will wipe it away. Now the Prophet knows he's got shame, he's got modesty. And that is the foundation that you always want. Rasulullah told us that one of the signs of the last hour is that haya, shame, will be lost. People don't care, it becomes normalized. Easy. Who cares if I've got a girlfriend or boyfriend? Everybody has. Man, I'm even gay. Who cares? Not me. Yani gay. They, even Muslims are saying that now. Who, what, what, so what? Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Nudity is normal. So what? If I walk around in my active way. It's active way. Everybody wears active way. Doesn't matter. Sometimes we've got to hit the nail on the head, guys. We've got to push the red button. Brothers and sisters in Islam, one of our fitra is shame and modesty. Wallahi, I was at a park one day, playing with my kids, and they were playing around, and I see this six-year-old girl approximately. She's wearing a dress and trying to um, play on the monkey bars, very low monkey bars. She wanted to do a somersault around the monkey bar. Her mum's sitting there. So the girl wanted to do a somersault and she stopped. Her mother said, go ahead, do a somersault. And the girl said, wallahi, by herself, mum, I'm wearing a dress. Mum, I'm wearing a dress. I said, well, let me watch what's going to happen here. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> so, subhanAllah. Everything's sensitive these days. Now let's get serious. Brothers and sisters, the mother says to her, that's okay, you're still a child. You're still a child. So the girl goes, oh, okay then. So she started somersaulting and didn't care that her dress was going up and down. I remembered the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu Every newborn is born on a natural instinctive nature. One of these instinctive natures is that every human being shares, I don't care what you say, Muslim, non-Muslim, boy, girl, is modesty and shame. The feeling of modesty and shame naturally comes into you. I have children. Hands up if you have children. Hands up if you have children. Girls. 
little girls, little boys, good. You know, there comes a time they, you, take your, you take your daughter to the toilet, mom, dad, take me toilet, toilet, and then suddenly she reaches an age where she says, I'll go by myself. Is my brother, is my brother around? You know, I want to put a towel around me. Is my sister around? I want to put a towel. By themselves. This is fitrah. Modesty and shame is inside of us. We are born with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this religion to suit your fitrah. So that means he has to have solutions for you. But we are the ones who corrupt ourselves. Allah says in the Quran, And the nafs, the nafs are your desires and yourself, you, who you are, the way the human being is. The way he made it. Allah gave the self two things. The tendency and the feelings to want to do shameful things and the tendency to do things that are pure and good. Whoever purifies themselves has succeeded. And whoever obeys their desires, just does whatever their desires tell them, their temptations and lusts, has lost. Life is a test, brothers and sisters. Life is a test. When Allah created Adam السلام, and told the angels to prostrate to Adam, do you know why? He told them, I know that which you do not know. This creature that I'm creating now, this human being, is not like any creature that you've ever imagined, O angels. Yeah, you don't have desires. These ones have desires. And they're going to beat their desires because they love me and I love them. How do I know Allah loves us and is close? Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ And if my worshipper asks you about me, I am close. It's us who needs to be close to Allah. Allah is always close by default. It's like the sun shining, giving you light, and you cover it. Take the cover off, the sun shines. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close. We cover it. That's why Allah says, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى Allah." Run away to Allah. The world is full of problems, full of issues, man. So Allah says, run away to me. Run away from all that which makes you afraid and come to me. Allah, the one who is more merciful than the mother to her own child. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ warned us as well. He said, There will come a time where people, I'll say the hadith actually, لم تظهر الفاحشة في قوم قط حتى يعلنوا بها إلا فشى فيهم الطاعون والأوجاع التي لم تكن مضت في أسلافهم الذين مضوا حديث زن ابن ماجة authentic he said any people listen carefully to this such an amazing hadith he says any people talks about our state today that you see Fahisha becomes manifest among them. Manifest, it becomes easily seen. Fashat, easily seen and spread. Fahisha means, whenever you hear the word Fahisha in the Quran or Hadith, it only means one thing. Indecent, dirty acts. Sexual acts that are haram. The haram sexual acts. There's halal sexual acts and there's haram sexual acts. Fahisha means the dirty sexual acts and they are the forbidden ones. They are only fahisha, means dirty and bad, for one reason. Because they harm you and don't suit you, the human being. It's the same reason why Allah forbid alcohol and pork. Pork is najas, it's dirty, not in itself. I mean, the pork itself, the pig itself, is a nice animal, it's a creature. It's a creature of Allah. It is, isn't it? We have to be merciful to it, the pig. But consuming it is not good for you. That's why it's haram, it's najas meaning. Your immune system, your makeup, your digestive system, your makeup as the human being is not fit to digest the meat of the pig. It's going to harm you. It's going to cause you diseases such as hepatitis in your liver. So it's not just for you. That's why it's haram. And there is nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram except for one reason. Who knows why? Who knows why Allah makes something haram? Who knows? I'm asking. It's not a rhetorical question. 
Can someone tell me what you think? What is the reason why Allah makes things haram? Yalla boys, answer. Let the sisters know you're an alpha. I'm joking. Wallahi, I'm joking. Tell me, brother. Because it's not good for you or it's harmful to you? It's harmful to you. It's harmful to you. When somebody forbids something from you because it's harmful to you, what does it tell you about that person? Like your parents. Hmm? Does it tell you that they care about you or want a hard life for you? Care about you. If a little child sees a nice colorful ball floating over the pool, two-year-old, the two-year-old is looking at the ball. Colorful, red, pink, green, nice. But doesn't know that they will drown in the pool if they don't know how to swim. So what does a parent do? Grabs the child. The child, what do they do? Ah, cries. Why? Why doesn't mum let me go get the ball? Why? I want to play. I want to play. Why? Bad mum. That's what the child's thinking. Doesn't know any better. Doesn't know any better. The mum says, you'll drown. It's two years old. How do they know what drowning means? Isn't that correct? The best thing to do is force the child away from the pool and then protect her from falling in, then get her the ball. It's not the ball that the mother doesn't, wants to prevent the child, it wants the child to play, it wants the child to have fun. Fun. But, doesn't want it to die in the process, doesn't want it to drown. Is that correct? Try to explain it to the child, child won't understand, what's the point? Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things haram and sometimes we don't know the whole reason for it because our intelligence is not strong enough and wide enough to know. Yes, we can guess certain things, but we see what happens. Some of us learn from our own actions and some of us are smart enough to learn from other people's actions. Rasulullah said, whenever fahisha is manifest and spread among a people, widespread, everybody does it and it becomes a norm. They start promoting it. They talk about it as if it's normal. Hey, I have a girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, good on you. Did you pick her up? Yeah. Oh, how did you do it? Alhamdulillah. Great idea. Hey, let me give you some pointers. This is what you do. Girls get together. We hear them, teenagers at school. Here's my boyfriend. That's my boyfriend. I did this or I did that. A lot of them are lying, by the way. But it's, you know, they just want to look good. And so the girls or boys who hear this from their friends, they think it's true. So they go and do it themselves and then they fall into problems. And then they go back and they say, you idiot, we were just joking, we are making it up. But that's how STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, happen. When people start normalizing certain acts that are meant to be harmful to you, and then people think, well, if everybody's doing it, and talk about teenagers, their frontal lobe is still developing, reasoning, analyzing, knowing right from wrong. They just think about their feelings and desires, which have just, subhanAllah, exploded as soon as they hit puberty. We've got to really feel for them and be there for them, inshaAllah. And this is how these things happen. Rasulullah said, they start spreading it and making it normal. People talk about it as if it's very normal. Hey, my little brother in kindergarten, I used to pick him up from kindergarten, we're talking like 30 years ago. And when I picked him up one day, I go, come here, I'll dink you on the bike. Aussie word, dink, on the bike. And he says to me, wait, 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 wait. He's only four years old, the little zmik. He goes to me, let me, let me, I, I need to find Jessica. <laughs> go, ule, ule, who's Jessica? Jessica, Jessica, he sees this girl, Jessica, a little blonde girl, comes up to her and carries her up, kisses her on the mouth and comes back to me. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> he goes to me, uh, Boba, she's my girlfriend. Like a Scott, in those days you're allowed to smack a child. Smacked him, took him home. What are you doing? He goes, all right, we all did it today in kindergarten. We did a good thing. Every boy has to choose a girlfriend. And she's my girlfriend. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. 30 years ago, guys. Now look where we are. Rasulullah said it becomes normal. He's got a girlfriend. How cute. Oh, you haven't got a girlfriend yet? You're a loser. 30 years old, never been with a girl. Still a virgin. I feel sorry for you, man. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Don't we hear this news? Like I'm saying it to you, you think, yeah, well, yeah, we do feel sorry for him. Wallah, I bet some of you thought like that. Am I right? Sometimes, because, I'll tell you why. It's not because you're a bad person. It's called classical conditioning. Anyone that studied psychology before? Sisters must have studied psychology. No? Psychology, classical conditioning. 
Classical conditioning, you he keep hearing something and seeing it over and over and over and over again. You know it's, if it's right or wrong, but then you start thinking it's normal and you practice it without noticing. Social media makes you think like that, especially those who are looking for a relationship. You look at social media and you see this false image of a beautiful, loving couple. They don't care about how they got together. You feel that you've been cheated, you're not happy, this is wrong, you're not happy in the marriage, you get out of it because of the expectations. Brothers and sisters, classical conditioning. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ then said, when people become normalized to these haram fahisha among them, he says, Illa fasha Serious sicknesses start to spread among them as well. Serious ta'un is, 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 is a word they used to use in those days for a person who had a permanent illness in their stomach and they died from it. So they are terminal illnesses. You can talk about all the different types of terminal illnesses. When you talk about terminal illnesses for fahisha, what first comes to your mind? What are incurable diseases today? Tell me. AIDS. What else? HIV. HPV. Hepatitis B. These are viruses that are incurable. And Rasul said they will appear. And he's also said, well, awja' and pain of hurt and sickness that never really existed before in people who existed before them. Some scientists might argue that they just didn't know what it was. But they can't prove that. Our Prophet ﷺ told us they didn't exist before. Brothers and sisters in Islam, that's what happens. We did not oppress them, it is they who oppressed themselves. Brothers and sisters, let me share with you something. When you get interested in someone, boy and girl, let's say, we'll talk about normal straight people, inshallah ta'ala. That's the easy one, I, we understand that. The others, we don't understand it. When you fall into an interest in someone, you go through three stages that scientists have studied. Number one, there is the lust stage, L-U-S-T. When you lust for someone, two hormones are released in your brain. For the men, more testosterone. For the girls, more estrogen. But they both have estrogen and testosterone, except in lesser levels than each other. This hormone does nothing except it serves your reward, your reward center. It's like drugs. Once you feel it the first time, you want to feel it again. No purpose except feeling. Testosterone, estrogen. Once you fulfill that need, the testosterone and estrogen goes away, and all you're left with is the after effects. Allahu alam what they are. Once you fall into lust, there is a second stage if you continue following that relationship, and it's called attraction. When you, fall, when you get to the stage of attraction, it lasts for weeks or months. This usually happens in the halal way, they are the people who are engaged to be married. You have attraction. Attraction releases hormones called dopamine and other hormones. And it lessens something called serotonin. Serotonin gives you satisfaction, security, and so on. The others, they make you energetic. You start to fantasize a lot. You start to get energetic. start doing things you never did before. And then you say, wow, he's changed me. <laughs> she has brought out something in me that I've never seen before. He said words to me that no one's ever said to me before. They just flooded me. Brothers and sisters, this is not real. These are just the hormones telling you that. It's like watching a mad movie. Fast and Furious. It lasts for about a few weeks and months. And what happens is that you feel this beautiful thing coming, which is nice in the halal way. Beautiful. Enjoy it in the halal way. It's beautiful. It's one of the best things you can ever, you know, and really embrace it because you're not going to feel it much again later on. What? But, but... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't leave you there. If you follow that relationship, it turns into something beautiful, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this is where the real relationship is, and it's called attachment. This is the husband and wife, this is a family attachment. And attachment releases a beautiful hormone called oxytocin. And that is the hormone that makes you feel secure, safe, loved, purpose, reason, importance self-esteem value when you get married everybody values you and they look at you differently isn't that correct 
I'll give you an example. If there is a relationship of boyfriend and girlfriend, and they don't want to get married the halal way, they say, oh, we're just getting to know each other, girlfriend, boyfriend. Let me tell you something. They say, what's wrong with it? All right. What's worse? A man or woman cheating on their husband and wife when they're married, or a girlfriend, boyfriend cheating on each other when they're not married? Which one's worse? When they're married. Like, what's the difference between being married and having a relationship outside of it in the same way? They're still sleeping together. They still look at each other like, you're for me, I'm for you, nobody else can touch you. They're still doing the same. Sometimes they share wealth together, sometimes they have children together. They live together. 20 years, de facto, partnered, not married. What's the difference? A word. The only difference is one is commitment and value. The other one is not commitment and not as much value. He's not really valuing her. She's not really valuing him because they're not ready to commit. Wallahi, I've spoken to non-Muslims about this all the time. And they say, yeah. One non-Muslim lady says, we've been in a relationship for, for like uh, seven years. And I've been telling him, let's get married. And he's just not ready. I said, well, if he values you, he'll get married. He goes, yeah, I want him to value me. Value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ قَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." We have honored the son of Adam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only tells us things that honor us. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then said. He told us, a man or a woman, whom a person, a man or a woman with prestige, power and beauty comes to them and calls them. Now, you might be thinking, well, <laughs> this other young fellow I remembered now. He comes to me, he goes, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, I committed zina. And I said, oh, then you've got to repent to Allah and so on and so forth. He goes, but I'm safe, brother, I'm safe. I go, what do you mean you're safe? He goes, she's not a woman of power and beauty. <laughs> no, no, no. When the Prophet ﷺ said a woman of power and beauty, what he's saying, what he's saying is, any man or woman that your community or society see as desirable. So it could be a celebrity. It could be someone who's in the olden days wasn't really pretty. It could be a woman with really short hair and got red and yellow all over it. Doesn't matter. If she's desirable, that's the woman. The idea is whatever is more desirable, Allah subhanahu wa puts you under his shade because you are struggling more. Anyway, even zina with a normal person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses it. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And those who do not commit adultery or fornication. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا Whoever does this act shall surely meet a terrible wrath. وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا And be placed in hellfire, humiliated. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابْ Except he or she who repents. وَآمَنْ Renews their faith. وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And does good deeds in return. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيَّعَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ These people, Allah will transform their bad deeds into good deeds. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. All your past sins are gone. Brothers and sisters, some people they say, I'll have a girlfriend or boyfriend now, I'll commit the haram, because then I will repent later. We say to you, you are like the brothers of Yusuf. They said, we will kill Yusuf or throw him in the desert, and then we'll repent later. But look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied. They suffered, and if, had, if they had died in that instance, they would go to hellfire for murder or for doing what they did for Yusuf alayhi salam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left them alive to happen to repent, alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, let's look at this hadith. Problems happen in the future. I want to tell you a few statistics. It is estimated that 84,000 abortions, you know what abortions are? When they go to the hospital, a woman is pregnant, doesn't want the baby, and tells the doctor to kill it and get rid of it. They put forceps inside into the uterus, and while the baby is alive, they dissect it organ by organ, bit by bit, as it's alive. There are estimated 84,000 abortions per year in Australia. In Adelaide, the, 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 they, keep, they keep record, not, not the other states they don't, but they estimate as 84,000 abortions per year, according to the research in the Medical Journal of Australia. And they are between the ages of 15 and 44. As for teenagers, between the ages of 15 and 19, it is estimated around 10,000 teenage abortions between the ages of 15 and 19 in Australia alone. 10,000 abortions of teenagers, uh, with teenage pregnancy 
between 15 and 19, according to the ABC The World Today report. It is estimated that it is 56 million abortions per year worldwide. 56 million abortions per year worldwide. And that's just what's recorded. As for what's not recorded, Allahu A'lam. 56 million murders per year. And Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ Do not kill your children because you fear you will not be able to raise them, provide them. We are the ones who will provide them and you. Medical specialists are today calling, excuse me, for better sex education in Australia. Wow, now we need sex education because it's getting out of hand. To primary school students. Primary school students. Grade 3, 4, 5, 6. Sex education. And for contraceptives to be made more available to teenagers in an effort to reduce the nation's teen pregnancy and abortion rates, according to the ABC's The World Today report. Why do they get abortions? Unwanted pregnancies. They're too small, too young. We were just having a talk before, this idea of teenager. Never existed in Islam. Barakallah fiq. I learned it from Sheikh Muhammad today. No words teenager in Islam. You're either a child or an adult. So when we tell them you're still a child, but they're actually adults, they can reproduce, they can get married, they can have children, they can do everything. We say it's cute. It's cute. But if she gets pregnant, you stupid idiot. That's what we call them. Why? We don't help them. We've not allowed them. And then they go to the hospital and get an abortion and kill babies. We teach them to be murderers. So haram sex between teenagers is halal for them. And some Muslims think, what's the problem with that? And then don't see the result that a murder is happening. That's why Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Do not come close to zina. إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً It's a dirty act. وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Its path, its road in the end is bad. Here is one example. Murder of babies. Sometimes teenagers don't know what to do. They're afraid either because of their parents or their culture or their tradition or because whatever it is is out on the street, babies end up in the trash cans. Orphanages are built. Brothers and sisters, lastly, STIs. You know what STIs are? Sexually transmitted infections or sexually transmitted diseases. These are more today than ever before. Prophet ﷺ said, new diseases will appear that didn't appear before. Listen to this. Wallahi, this is staggering research. I saw this. In the Australian ABC Health Reports, it says, one of the STIs called gonorrhea, you know what gonorrhea is? It's one of the STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. It's very, very popular, very common. Only gonorrhea, 19,000 were infected in 2015. 19,000 were infected in 2015. In 2006, nine years ago, only 9,000 were reported to be infected. Look how much more have been infected in only these years. And they're saying that there is a, a tremendous rise in STDs as the years go by. Because zina and adultery and fornication is also becoming more and more. Wallah, it's becoming more and more. There is a, all these STDs, chlamydia, syphilis, all these names that they brought, they are on the rise. And in Australia, chlamydia is the highest form of STDs. I had a sister without saying her name anonymous she said to me what do I do I have to tell my future husband the guy who's asked for my hand do I have to tell him that I've got STD Muslim sister in hijab everything beautiful sister loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but unfortunately in the past she fell into haram unfortunately these STDs don't just go away you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they still stay should I tell him? I said, of course you have to tell him. But why? Islam covers the sin. You shouldn't tell your sins. I said, that's different. He's going to get infected. If you get pregnant, your children are going to get infected unless you get it treated. And when we talk about treatment, it doesn't make it go away. Bacteria goes away, but there are some of them that don't go away. You have to keep it under treatment, like eczema. If you've got children who've got eczema, you put this cream on, it just manages it. If a woman hasn't managed her STD, and she is pregnant and gives birth, the child has an STD for the rest of their life. How bad of an end it is. Did you know that some STDs don't show until six months later? Some of them don't have symptoms at all and they're in you. 
And subhanallah, what an amazing thing scientists and doctors have said. They said, and they keep repeating this, the surest way to avoid transmission of STI is to abstain from sexual contact or to be in a long-term mutual monogamous relationship with a partner who has been tested and is known to be uninfected. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, stay away, don't come close, don't do this? Isn't that right? This is already 1,400 years ago, the Prophet ﷺ told us about this. Allah told us that. HIV, hepatitis B, AIDS. More than 1 million adults every year and children die from HIV positive in sub-Saharan Africa alone. 91% of them are children. 91% of them are children. What have children done? What have children done? They are born with AIDS. 90% are children of the 34 million HIV positive in the world. Children. My brothers and sisters in Islam, they said the main cause of STD is multiple sex partners, infected ones, sexual acts which happen to be forbidden in Islam. Like even if it's halal, you're married, there are certain sexual acts that are haram in Islam. Why? Because they cause STDs for you and your wife. Uh, and believe it or not, they said, all the studies agree that males who have same-sex partners and bisexuals most affected with HIV and AIDS due to the nature of their sexual act. Brothers and sisters, I've said the word like so many times and I'm cringing right now. And some of you are probably cringing from that word. Let me tell you something. It is time to break this taboo and to address it and talk about it. There is no taboo in Islam when it comes to guiding people to the right path. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasulullah in the Al-Quran and Sunnah tells us the solutions to these things. What are they? Now I'm going to tell you the obvious one that everybody's going to roll their eyes about, I know. Marriage. Marriage is the best solution. It'll definitely minimize it a lot. Marriage has its ups and downs as well, of course. But marriage is the best solution for staying away from this harm and from zina. We have problems. Parents are stubborn. Some parents are stubborn. Some parents are too traditional. Some parents, they refuse just because of his look or because he's not from the same culture or whatever. Or she is not. Then you have young people. They don't want to tell their parents anything. They want to get their advice because automatically they've stereotyped their parents. Oh, they're old-fashioned. You know, the old cheese doesn't know. How do they know? They're still ancient-minded. They don't know. The society has changed. Come on, man. They've been there, done that. It's just that people think a little bit differently today. I know, and there's social media and all that stuff. But, you know, the result is the same. They'll give you great advice. They'll tell you how their marriage works. They'll tell you how they used to do it and they'll tell you how they used to get to know each other and you can still follow that they'll give you advice man they've got experience your parents have made mistakes and they can tell you a lot of important information well like even myself my son asks me things and you know what I look back at myself and I say I'm not going to let my son repeat the same mistake I did and I can tell him now and I tell him son I did this and that was a mistake for me if I were to turn back time I'll do it this way so now you have a second chance have that conversation, communication with your children. Have a conversation with your parents from a young age. Do not be ashamed to do that. When I was in year seven, when we weren't allowed, sorry, we had the first time in year seven in 19... Oh my God, I can't even remember. The, how was it prehistoric, am I? Uh, year seven was in like 1990, 1989. And it was the first time that sex education was brought into year seven. But you had to get your parents' permission. What do you think my dad did? Do you think you could give him a permission? No. <laughs> Can't learn that, man. So what happens? I said, but dad, what am I going to do? I'm going to fail the test. He goes, I will teach you. <laughs> That's when I thought, oh crap, I can't sleep anymore. And he did. He did teach me. And he taught me with the adab, with the morals that Islam teaches us. And I came out and passed the test. When I got back to school, they're all talking about girlfriend and boyfriend and whatever, and I felt there was a bit of disrespect to the girls. Yeah? Islam, when it teaches you about it, it teaches you how to respect the person and how to develop a relationship, not just bodily feelings. So, 
teaching and educating our children from a young age and communicating with them as young as eight and nine years old, talk about puberty. Talk with your parents about it. Listen to them. Just listen. They're not going to force you to do stuff, right? No one can force you to do anything. They might pressure you, but look, you know what? As a parent, I would love my child to come and talk to me about it. I will feel a bit safer. I'll be, feel a bit secure that my child is coming back and forth to me, even if they're thinking the wrong way. But when he hides or she hides everything from me, and two years later comes and says to me, hey, Dad, I'm interested in this girl. I'm interested in this boy. Two years later, I'm not, the father's the last person to know. It's going to cause enormous tension and fear because the parents want the best for you. Why keep them out of the picture? You're going to tell them anyway. Is it because you just want to test the waters first? Is he the right man for me? Is she the right girl for me? And then I'll tell my parents. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting to see if there's chemistry? Let me tell you something. Take this advice, brothers and sisters. You don't really know a person until you see them in their comfort zone. What is their comfort zone? Well, what are you doing? What kind of relationship do you want? You want a marriage. When you marry someone, you marry their whole family. Yeah, their brothers and sisters, their father and mother, their cousins, their relatives, everyone. So if you and her and you and him are just together getting to know each other, you're not going to know much. I mean, we have students at school, they come and they put on an image, they put on a different face. At home, they're different. I know from myself, I know from my children. You want to see them in their family environment. You want to see how their brothers and sisters treat them, how they treat their brothers and sisters. You want to see how they relationship with their mum and dad. You know, for example, a boy who bashes his sisters will bash you. A boy who doesn't listen to his mum and disrespects her will disrespect you. You're not going to be above his mother. A girl who disrespects her father will disrespect you as a husband. Who are you? I didn't even listen to my dad. Why are you? Yeah, you want to see what they are. But then if you see that they respect their sister, they respect their brother, you know, oh my God, you know, he's really compassionate towards his mother. I love that. I love a guy who's compassionate to his mother. <laughs> wow, she respects her dad. Ah, I really have to go and speak to the dad now, don't I? Hey, this family, I am not going to leave her alone, mashallah, because they've got values, man. What you need to know about a person are the values that you share. Everything else, you actually learn it together. There's no such thing as prepare before the marriage. The only thing you prepare is values, and your Islam are your values, and you know what they are. Knowing each other, you know each other as you go along. As you go along, you grow together. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, if you're thinking dating in the Western way, I've got some advice for you. It's, it's not really working, right? Dating in Islam means getting engaged with the knowledge of the parents and the family. That way, you ensure that you protect your honor and your dignity. And Rasulullah said, any man and woman who are strangers to each other, who are alone in the room, the shaitan is the third. You can't help it. Your hormones will react. What are you, a robot? You a robot? I mean, a brother says to me, Bro, I got attracted to this girl, man, I did some haram things. Like, in my head, I'm thinking, oh man, it's bad, it's, it's a sin. But at the same time, I'm thinking, at least he's normal, man. At least he's normal. He's reacting to, you know, the opposite sex. That's all right. It's okay to love someone, to feel loved, to feel attracted. Sometimes our students say to us, I like this girl, sir, and, you know, but I can't get married right now. Is it haram that I'm liking her? I love her. I get, it's okay, man. It's okay. Hey, you, li you like her attributes. That's fine. You can keep her in your mind. You can keep him in your mind. That's okay. That's our halal version of high school sweethearts. But when you finish high school, then go and ask for her hand the right way from her father in the house and get to know her then. Give the parents the benefit of the, of the doubt, guys, and let them be involved with you. And then you can discuss and talk. It's better in the beginning than later. Because when you're emotionally attached to someone, wallahi, the damage is worse. You're gonna, your heart's going to break badly. And I've seen it so many times. We've got family members, friends. I mean, firsthand, wallahi dealing with counseling them and my heart breaks for them because they took it the wrong way and their heart is broken at least if you took it the right way and then your heart is broken at least there's no guilt that you went the wrong way you don't have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well so the guilt is double and then we hear about people hurting themselves and suicidal thoughts and so on I hear all the time relationships so my brothers and sisters in Islam from a young age marriage now I know as you become a teenager, you can't afford to get married. I'm really an advocate for people to get married at a younger age. And I'm always talking to parents. And I hope, inshallah, our communities can change to support young people to get married at a very young age. We can do it. It used to be done all the time. Except society has now evolved, changed into this 
thing where you're 20, 30 years old and they still say, oh, you're still young, you're still a child. Us as Muslims, us as Muslims, we can't afford to be like those who, you know, don't want to get married but they, but they have relationships in the haram way. We can't afford to that because if you can't get married and you can't have an intimate relationship with a girl or a boy, you're stuck. The grave's going to be your partner. You can't. We can't afford to say, I don't want to get married. What else are you going to do? And then fall into haram? You can't. At the same time, brothers and sisters, uh, there's something called katb iktab. Ever heard of it? Katb iktab. Aqd nikah I did my nikah contract. Sometimes I come and say, look, we don't want to do the whole thing yet. The whole thing, you know, wedding and all that. But can we do a katb iktab? Parents ask me. Why? Oh, look, they know each other. They like each other. We just want them to get to know each other in a halal way. So that's fine. You can do a katb iktab on, on paper with witnesses. You write a mahar and you're technically married on paper, but with a condition. You're not going to move in together. You can go out together a little bit. Someone will be with you. This is a Lebanese thing. And uh, she wears a ring. Is, I've done them a katb iktab ring. And you can get to know each other so that if you said something that you shouldn't have said when you were engaged, you can say it then. You touched, you kissed, you hugged, whatever. Um, it happens, right? But you're actually married technically. And then you want to delay it till the wedding time. At least that relief is, you know, there's that relief, inshallah ta'ala. So that's one solution, inshallah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the other way, I don't think you would want it for your brother or for your sister or for your children. So if you don't practice it yourself, they're going to imitate you. That's what's going to happen. Lastly, my brothers and sisters in Islam, if you fall into haram and you will all the time, don't go around telling people about it. Don't share it with people. Don't. You don't need to confess to people to feel better about yourself. Don't. In Islam, it's the opposite. To feel better about yourself, you confess it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. No one else. Because then people normalize it and they may encourage you and get ideas. Talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell him, Ya Rabb, I'm weak. I did this and I did that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. But when you say it, there's a connection with you and Allah. You, you feel it. And then suddenly you start to cry. You, you feel, you actually cry when you do that. Because it's so intimate and special between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, how beautiful that feeling is. I don't know if you guys have been through it. I miss that feeling. And sometimes, you know, you sit up at night and you make wudu and you just say, Oh Allah, I'm weak. I've got problems. Or you just wake up and say, Ya Allah, I just want to talk to you. Because I love you. That's it. Wallahi, Allah's, Allah opens doors for you after that. Wallahi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you things from places you never expected. All you have to do is use, is protect yourself from Allah. You know, repent to Him. Try your best to avoid the haram as much as you can. If you can't, repent. Do good deeds to wash it away. It's called taqwa. Allah says, I will open doors for you. I will open doors for you. Wallahi azim and Allah promises and guarantees those eyes that cry in the middle of the night when you are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I'm going to protect you on a day of judgment with me. You are so special. وَالشَّابُ التَّائِبُ حَبِيبُ اللَّهِ The young person, only the young, not the old, the young, who always asks Allah to forgive them, is the beloved of Allah. He is Habibullah. Habibullah. Only the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is Habibullah. And Allah says, الشَّابُ التَّائِبُ حَبِيبُ اللَّهِ The young person. Not person who's over 40, under, young, maybe 30 and, and, and under. You are Habibullah when you do what? He didn't say when he doesn't sin. He didn't say when he worships a lot. He says when he repents a lot. Meaning you do wrong and you come back. You do wrong and you come back. You do wrong and you come back. The one whom Allah hates is the one who deliberately defies Allah and argues and says, why is it all haram? And keeps going. I don't want Allah in my life. That's the one who turns away from Allah. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, I end it with this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Wallahu yuridu ay... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu yuridu ay yatuba alaykum wa yuridu alladheena yattabi'oon al-shahawati an tamilu maylan azeema. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to always forgive you 
and open the door to come close to him. Tawb, ya tawba alaykum means open the door to come close to him. He wants you to come close to him. Allah wants to keep you near. Allah wants to keep you near and come close to him and forgive you. But those who follow their desires and temptations among your friends and people that you are around, they want to move you away from Allah a far distance. Yuridu Allah an yukhaffifa ankum. What does Allah want? Allah says, Allah wants to lessen the burden of you. That's why he made things haram and halal. وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Man was created weak. Allah knows you are weak. 